ಶ್ವರಾಯ ಭೂತ 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 ಶ್ವರಾಯ ಕಾಲ 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 ಶ್ವರಾಯ ಶಿವ ಶಿವ ಸ ಶಂಭ ಶಂಭ ಶರ್ಮ ಚೋರ ಆವೇದ 
चरण कृतम कर्म जम श्रवण नयन जम मानस वापराधम विहितम विहित वर्वे तत्मस्व जय जय करुणाब्दे जय जय करुणाब्दे श्री महादेव शंभो नमस्कार नमस्कार एवरीवन वेल this uh terrible task of looking at the death toll 
every day <laughs> is not a good thing. But it's important, it's important everywhere, but particularly India, because this is the way human mind goes around. After a few days, uh, well, nothing happened to me. Nothing happened to my family. Even my neighbors are doing okay. I thought the virus will get them, but even they're okay. So maybe this whole thing is a hoax, it's a conspiracy from somewhere. Somebody spread this news and uh, they just made up this to steal our economy, to decimate our economy. I'm not making this up, it's going on. So death toll is a clear sign that nobody is making it up. People are not pretending to die, they're genuinely dying. United States uh, has crossed fifty-two thousand dead. Spain twenty-two or twenty-three thousand, France twenty-three thousand, Germany six thousand, UK crossing twenty thousand, hmm, and many other the parts of the world much better but still happening. In India we have crossed seven hundred and seventy-five, but in India the death toll is dipping significantly. Seeing that uh, the state governments are encouraged and now as you know in Tamil Nadu, there is a curfew, not a lockdown. Many other states are going into the same mode, more geographically contained because fifty percent of India's virus cases come from just uh, Maharashtra, Gujarat and Delhi, which is a, just a city, not a state really. Well, state legally, but in geography it's just a city. Just these three locations account for fifty percent. If you add another three, four states like Uttar Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and uh, Madhya Pradesh and Kerala, that's eighty percent. That means a large part of India is completely unaffected. Well, that is the impact of the lockdown. That's what it's done, it's contained it geographically. So seeing the results, states are going for more aggressive lockdowns. But of course, uh, economic pressures are there, mm, which will make us take certain compromising steps which we must take, but if it comes with absolute discipline from the citizens everywhere in the world, it will muck, it'll work much, much better because this is essentially human to human right now. Well, some tigers have got it, I'm sure you're not planning to go and hug the tiger, so it's okay. <laughs> Two lions and a tiger in the American zoos have got virus. There's a few cases of uh, pet cats and dogs getting it, but it's been found that in the animals, it's in a very mild form. But they could still be carriers, but the main culprit is the human being. Mm -hmm. So how human beings, individual human beings, as societies, as nations we behave, accordingly we could limit the damage to that extent, both mortality rates and the economic damage can be contained substantially if all of us behave with some discipline and responsibility. So it's for that reason only I'm reading this death toll every day, because if you don't have sense, at least you may have some fear. Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> if you are sensible, then it would be easy 
But if people are not sensible, the next thing is fear. At least out of fear, they will behave sensibly. This is something that always intrigued me. Why is it fear is being held as a virtue? <laughs> well, I think I've spoken before about this, but anyway, even as uh, I was a young boy, because I think I never was a child maybe, when I'm like ten, eleven years of age or even, yeah, around that much or even less than that, I always heard my father constantly being worried about me. He has no fear in his heart, what will happen to this boy? One day I turned around and asked, when did fear become a virtue? He said, see, I told you he has no fear in his heart. Well, when you look back and see, you will see, unfortunately, most religions in the world, political establishments in the world, and parents and teachers, always used fear as the most effective tool to get what they want. Fear of hell, fear of shot to death, fear of punishment, fear of beating, fear of abuse, fear of shame. They used fear as the main tool of their trade, unfortunately including parents. Well, I think it is changing substantially, but still it's the underlying factor of most societies. Because people still believe that fear will bring out the best in people. I think that is the most ridiculous and disastrous idea that spread across the world that fear will bring about the best in people. Fear may control human beings from doing certain things, but fear will not liberate people from anything. Fear entangles a human being so badly and curtails a human being so badly, in many ways crushes a human being to become a small creature just desperate to survive rather than being a grand being, not behaving like top of the line life on this planet. <laughs> you are the evolutionary crown of all life upon this planet, not behaving like the peak, behaving like bottom because fear. Fear not just of immediate consequences, but fear that you may suffer somewhere else. Fear of hell has been one of the big factors in controlling and managing people. When, well, People are also God-fearing <laughs> The many things that we do in the form of bringing up our children, educating them, turning them towards the source of creation, all with fear, how will you ever succeed? because fear is debilitating. You, you need... If, if you want to blossom, <laughs> if you want to know some sense of liberation within you, you need all that you have and more. <laughs> what you have is not enough. You need everything that you got and you need more, little more, push from the outside. Otherwise, one will not make it. But now crushing a human being with fear 
and making them less than what they are, and then hoping they will attain to something high, is a very ridiculous thing. This happened. Uh, a mother is trying to encourage a young boy to drink goat's milk. Ah, uh, but the boy, not interested. So the mother says, you drink goat's milk. You will always remain young. You will never get old. The boy looks at her and says, Mom, if that is so, how come our neighbor's goat, only four years old and he's got a beard? And I've never seen any goat ever getting old, of course, and that you're right, because somebody will make biryani out of him, not because he's remained young, <laughs> because somebody eats him up. Nobody allows him to get old. So, incentives are one way, fear is another way. But the most beautiful way is always that you're committed enough to bring about sense. To make sense to somebody, it takes a lot of time and effort. The same thing, you can get it done in fear, in two minutes. I'm talking about management techniques. But <clears throat> because if you have to make somebody understand every aspect of what needs to be done, what could be said in one word as an order, you have to say a hundred things, look at me. <laughs> what can be said in one word, in a hundred different ways? But still, if you pull them out of the pit of ignorance today, tomorrow morning they'll be back there once again. Still you have to pull them back today, tomorrow morning they'll be back again. Well, that is the nature of this work, but if even if somebody makes an incremental step towards a more sensible existence, you will have wonderful things around you. But if you get the same thing done out of fear or much more out of fear, you will have such an ugly atmosphere, the very air you breathe will be poisonous. When everybody around you is in fear, the very air you breathe, will be poisonous. You must see uh, if you're sensitive. I've uh, worked in these prisons... No, no, I... I did not get admission, I went there to teach uh, in the engineering programs at one time, full ten days. I was there in many prisons, both in India and in United States. Well, if you look at the prison, it's pretty well organized. In fact, for a whole lot of people who come from the lower strata of society, they're dressed better than they were dressed outside. They have a better diet, they're eating better, obviously they look more healthy. And uh, all their practices are good, all addictions are out. And everything happens on time, everything on time. And uh, people turn on the lights for you, turn off the lights for you, like Isha Yoga Center, you know? <laughs> they even do open doors for you. Of course, they also close it. No, no, there is so much struggle in homes. Today, lock the front door and come. Oh, huh, why should I do it? You do it. Sir, no such problem. Somebody else does everything for you. In many ways, for people who come from a certain strata of life, physical and material aspects of life 
are better organized in the prison in their homes, in, than in their homes actually. But the suffering, the suffering is in the air, the pain is in the air. If you... I've never been into these prisons and come out without tears in my eyes because the very air that you breathe is full of pain. I... as a part of uh, visiting a certain uh, his, historical place, you know, it's like a monument in Tennessee, an old prison during the Civil War and that kind of stuff. I went into the gallows, they took us there as a part of the tour. You won't believe, maybe the last time anybody hung there was a hundred years ago, I'm not sure, but a long time ago. But if you enter that place, it just hits you in the face. Even today, after so many years, it's like suffocating the fear, extreme levels of fear and suffering, what people have gone through, just lives in the atmosphere like that. So this is the most important thing, if you really want to change the world, if you want to change the atmosphere in your home, in your society and in the world as a whole, the most important thing is, people should feel pleasant within themselves. Well, what to do? People are committed to misery and they keep going back and going back, you have to pull them back and pull them back, if not for their sake, at least for you to live in a healthy atmosphere. <laughs> yes, because otherwise if they're all living in misery and fear, it will create such a poisonous atmosphere for you. Poison, do not take it literally because now uh, there are social media champions who will immediately say, let me test the air in the gallows. Nothing is wrong with the same composition of oxygen and carbon dioxide. This is because nothing subtle has ever been felt by you. Right now, all of you are alive. I'm glad this is a time of reading death toll, but you're alive. It's wonderful that you're alive. But for most human beings, the only proof of their aliveness is their heart is beating. See, we can pull out the heart from your body and still make it beat on machines. That doesn't mean that person is alive, that person is for sure dead. Or some electrical impulses or breath, well, ventilator can breathe without you. So, only physical proofs of your body being there, there is no proof as such, nobody has established a proof that really there is life within you. We are only looking at the consequences of life. Because you're alive, you're breathing, your heart is beating and whatever else is happening, the medical parameters, that is fine. But does it mean to say, beyond this body you don't exist? Such people are assuming they landed on the planet just like this. They don't understand, we slowly gathered the body. When you were five years of age, you were the same person, ten years of age, same person, twenty-five years of age, same person, hundred years, same person, as far as you are concerned. Well, you might have gathered more memory, more experience, more wealth, more nonsense, but in your experience, you're still the same person. So you always existed beyond the size and shape of the body. So when this is the case, tell me where is the proof of your aliveness? Because most human beings don't know what aliveness is. They are only as if they are checking somebody else, my heart is beating so I am alive, how stupid is that? It is all right when we are checking somebody, somebody is lying down here, we check their breath and say, okay, he is alive. You check your own breath and say, yeah, I am alive. Uh, you're af you, have to, you have lost it, you know, there is no question about it. So there are such people, they'll say, where is the poison? Show me. <laughs> so if I say, if you, you know, if you handle the water in such a certain ways, on the level of molecular level, uh, it turns poisonous. 
Then they say, okay, I'll give you a sealed bottle, turn it into poison, let me see. Well, there are certain creatures who thrive on poison, we know that. It's not that we don't know that. But you need to understand, life need not be poisoned chemically. You can poison yourself with fear. You can poison yourself with anxiety. You can poison yourself with a wrong thought, wrong emotion. Just a wrong posture can poison you. Yes, just a wrong way of sitting is poisoning you. Otherwise, why do you think for thousands of years we invested in the science of yoga? Well, if you think it's nothing, I want you to understand, it's the only thing. Just look back and see. It is the only thing other than basic survival aspects like eating, sleeping, reproduction and excretion. Apart from these things, the only thing which has lived for fifteen, twenty thousand years is yoga. Not because of propagation, simply because of its efficacy. So, if you do not understand the nature of your own existence, then you will create all these things. So this is not about being fearful, this is about becoming sensible, knowing we are mortal, always knowing every moment of our life, virus or no virus, we are still mortal. But with sense, with sensible behavior, with responsible handling of life, we can minimize many possibilities and at the same time enhance various other dimensions of our life. Because right now it's clearly demonstrated around the world, nations which took the responsibility of taking sensible action, mortality is minimum. Nations which arrogantly try to do something, they're paying the price, unfortunately. So it's very important to understand at this point because the lockdown is coming to an end, at some time it has to come to an end because no government, no political force can ever keep people under lockdown forever. Six weeks is a miracle if you ask me. It's really a miracle. Six weeks, largely we've been successful except for a few irresponsible groups, largely we have been successful, phenomenal achievement both for the administration and for the people of this country and many other nations too, which are participating in similar process. Not by force, just by, you know, bringing sense to people, telling them, this is it. You have to understand, otherwise you may not exist. So, there is never a old goat. <laughs> that doesn't mean they stayed young. When <laughs> there is a... You know, when we are... when we were uh, training for hang gliding, flying and things like that, there used to be a saying, there are uh, old pilots and bold pilots, there are no old bold pilots. So this is a time like that, if you're too bold, you will never be old, that's advantage. Namaskara Sadhguru, earnest greetings to you. I am Dr. Gayatri from Mumbai, had this question to ask. Ayodhya and North India as such is a land of the lords. From Lord Ram to Krishna, all have taken birth there and considered so sacred. But still North India is always under conflict. Lot of violence, abuse, addiction cases are more prevalent in that part of nation despite being so holy. Why is it so? <laughs> oh. <clears throat> well, uh, if you look at Rama's life, more closely if you look at Krishna's life, obviously people around him of his time also were very violent people. No qualms about doing all kinds of terrible things to each other. It's only because of that, probably, that the significance of a man like Krishna 
with his sense of balance, playfulness, involvement, wisdom, and above all, uh, a tremendous sense of grace that he exuded, all became significant. If everybody was living absolutely well without tyrants doing terrible things, I don't think he would have shined as he did. Because of all these terrible people, becomes very significant. See, here uh, the yoga center is full of flowers. I don't know how many of you are noticing the fragrance and the beauty of these flowers. This is a very, very intricate and fantastic flower called Krishna Kamalam. Most people wouldn't have seen this flower, very intricate thing. Well, it's in many places in yoga center. If you are... <laughs> if you are in a tourist mode, I am saying. I have nothing against tourists and tourism, we need it. Right now it's in a great hit, so definitely we need. But tourists usually are... You know, these days... No, not even that. That's gone. Those days are gone of taking pictures of other people and things. This is all about you now. So if you're in that kind of mode, you'll whoop... Going like this, uh, you will not sense anything subtle, you will not stare, stop, because uh, Krishna Kamalam will not uh, come and pop up in front of your face and take a selfie. It'll just be there, gently exuding its fragrance. You need little sensitivity. If you're not smelling the flower, maybe you have the virus. And some of you may notice, ah, some fragrance, some fragrance, ah. Well, the Krishna Kamalam is exuding one kind of fragrance, the, you know, the Sampige exuding another kind of fragrance and the jasmine exuding another kind of fragrance. The variety of flowers exuding different kinds of fragrance. I am very sure even here, they just a few people or let's call them noses. <laughs> they're just a few noses which poke their nose into every flower and they know the difference. <laughs> Others, ah, flowers, something. Most others don't even know, for them only, dinner time is coming. The smell of the food draws them. I'm not trying to uh, demean and make fun of everything, but that is the reality of life. If in this garden so many flowers, most people wouldn't have noticed what is what. But suppose you are walking in a desert where everything is harsh, just sand, in the middle there was just one lotus flower, would you miss it? No way you will miss it. In a way, that is what happened to these people, Krishna. Because around situations are tyrannical, people are doing terrible things, one man rises above all those things. Not a saint who sits in the mountains, not a saint who doesn't live a life, Somebody who is absolutely involved with everything, but still well above everything. Nobody could miss him, how could they miss him? He's too beautiful to be missed in that atmosphere. Suppose there were one thousand people like him, that's not possible, it's never happened, such a thing. But suppose even there were ten, they would have missed him. Only one, so he shines. Well, after he's, go after he's gone, did they get the point? No, because uh, maybe not exactly halfway down, but towards the end of his life, he went to Gujarat, you know that. And uh, there, uh, things happened tragically and his own clan fought among each other and killed almost every one of them, died in battles among themselves because they had gotten used to fighting battles with somebody all their lives, suddenly no enemy, so they decided to fight among themselves. What to do with a lifetime of practice that you have of fighting and killing, 
When there is nobody to kill, you kill among yourself. <laughs> so that's how it ended, unfortunately. But the significance of their lives are not gone, of course. In... Uh, I think in India there is a saying, if you keep a lamp which spreads light to everybody, just beneath the la lamp always there will be darkness. So this happened, but if you take it to a larger expanse, if you take it elsewhere, you will see the places or from the geographical location from where the major religions have come. Where Jesus is born, where Judaism was born, where even Islam was born, well, last two thousand years has not been shining light for anybody huge amount of violence, probably cruelest things happening, the soil is soaked with blood, that whole region, still continuing. I don't think one single day passes without some effort to kill somebody because of long-term hatred going on. So individual people fighting for something is a different matter, but Large groups of people, either race, religion or nations, continuing to fight for a thousand years means we've lost it. Fights will happen, unfortunately, should not happen, but it will happen, human beings sometimes spill over. You must come to your senses. <laughs> but over two thousand years, if you're fighting, well, you've really lost it, no question about it. So the same thing, at least... Uh, the Yadavas and the Uttar Pradesh people are not going to that extent. They have brought the organized fight to individual level of uh, fighting, little improvement. At least they are not fighting clan against clan, they've come down, it's become more economic, more individual, more d lack of discipline, those kind of things. Well, uh, <laughs> we must see, we need to discipline them. Today, uh, somehow, in their land, uh, they have even elected a yogi. <laughs> Hope he brings some discipline to the land. Uh, I think he is trying, whatever. I don't want... I, this is not a political statement, it's just ironic. A land which has seen uh, so much violence and so much uh, all kinds of things, now uh, chooses a yogi as their chief minister, which is... A little tongue-in-cheek for me, but uh, <laughs> this is not <laughs> about making a statement about him or the people, but this is how the world has been. Especially wherever a shining light came around that, people didn't get it, far away people got it. Close by, people didn't get it. Uh, because uh, they're little blinded by that light, they can't see a thing. People who far away could see the value of who those people are. But uh, those who are close by generally miss the point. Need not be so in future, but that has been the general history of human beings that when something is close up, they miss it. When it's far away, they hanker for it. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, they did that to Krishna also, but Krishna moved to Gujarat. He is very popular in Gujarat even today. And uh, from there, post his time, they sent his image to Kerala. You know this? Oh. This is... Uh, there are cl claims and counter claims about this, but the first temple that was built for Krishna, when he was still alive, they built a temple for him. So when things went wrong and uh, battles happened and uh, this temple could be destroyed, then it is said Vyasa took the idol that was in the temple because he didn't want it to be destroyed and took a sailboat and sailed down the coast to Kerala. That is why it is called Guru Vayur, because a guru who used the wind to come down south and established it in Guru Vayur. 
Even today, from all over the country, all the Krishna devotees are beelining to Guru Ayur because that is supposed to be the original deity of... in his form. So, uh, it lives in many places, but close up, little problem. But maybe there also it will shine now, if people have chosen discipline as their head of state for that state. Maybe they got the desire to change, which is a very welcome change <laughs> Yoga, yoga, yogeshwaraya Bhuta, bhuta, bhute swaraya Kale, kale, kale swaraya Shiva, Shiva, Sarve swaraya Shambha, Shambha, Maha.